Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone. This is the second part of microbial growth. This is lecture 50 of module 10. So in this particular topic we are going to look at how to culture bacteria and how to quantify them. So we will take a look at plate count and membrane filtration as well as microscopic methods. Now when we talk about growing cultures of bacteria in the lab, how can it be done? So the first thing is to understand what are the different types of cultures. The first thing is pure versus mixed. When I'm growing a culture in the lab, it can be a single species, in which case we call it a pure culture. And if we take a bacterial consortium, for example, if I take a soil sample and use it to inoculate my media, then I will have a large number of organisms, not just bacteria, but uh, fungi and so many other organism. So in that case it becomes a mixed culture. So that is the first difference. The second difference is whether it's a solid based media or a liquid media. I can grow a bacteria on either a solid surface which is generally an agar based surface or I can grow it in a liquid media. So I can have a what is called a nutrient broth that is the most common uh, liquid media that is used in the lab for culturing bacteria. It's generally um, it's generally a multi-purpose or a general purpose uh, kind of media and it's always in liquid form. So you can have agar based media or uh, broth based media. These culture media can be chemically fully defined. So you can have very very specific chemicals or salts added to the media and these are called chemically defined uh, culture media or you can have undefined or complex media. So I'll show you examples of all of them. And uh, these chemically defined media may need the use of growth factors. Growth factors we have seen are micronutrients and vitamins that are required for culturing specific organisms. And uh, there is another method which I'm not going to go into, but you can also add certain inhibitor compounds which will inhibit the growth of all other compounds except the one that you're trying to culture. So that is also possible. And we're not going to go into it into any detail, but I'll just show you examples of a chemically defined culture media. So here you have a very simple culture media for cultivating thiobacillus species. So defined culture media which can be grown on thiobacillus uh, agar and you can see the salts ammonium sulfate, monopotassium phosphate, calcium chloride, ferrous sulfate, magnesium sulfate, sodium thiosulfate and uh, agar which is the solid basis on which the cultures, um, the colonies of the bacteria will be formed. So it's a well defined culture medium. And there are several examples. This is just one example. You can do this for any number of species and there are well-defined culture media that are used for different species. Here we have an undefined culture media which can be used for culturing a large number of microorganisms. So nutrient agar which is used very commonly, you can use it for any number of organisms and you can see the kinds of materials that are used. You have 0.5% peptone to provide not just organic nitrogen but also other nutrients. Then you have 0.3% beef extract or yeast extract. It contributes vitamins, carbohydrates, nitrogen, salts and so many other things. So it's a fully mixed media and you have 1.5% agar to give the mixture solidity when it is incubated and some amount of salt is required and this is remember what I said to maintain isotonic conditions to, similar to the uh, ionic strength of the cytoplasm of most organisms. So that will help to maintain the 
ionic strength inside and outside the cell so that that does not become a problem factor. Uh, so, we can use sterilized buffered water. Now, sterilization and buffering of the water that is used is essential to ensure that the isotonic conditions are met, that the pH is near neutral. So, we try to keep it around 7, it can go to 6.5, 8, even the bacteria will not die, but if it goes beyond that, they are likely to die. And uh, the temperature generally, generally incubation temperature is 35 degrees centigrade. And I say that because we are generally, especially in uh, environmental uh, microbiology, the kinds of experiments we do are either with pathogenic species that may be found in water or in the normal environment. And we want to keep the temperature as close to environmental conditions as possible. So, we may want to keep it at 35 degrees centigrade, but depending on other objectives of the experiment, you may have any other temperature or pH even. So, here you see streak plates of pure cultures of four different species. So, you have Klebsiella pneumoniae, Morganella, Providentia, Salmonella and so on. So, these kinds of things can be done very easily in the lab. Then we have what is called a differential cultural medium. Now, you can use diff uh, different types of culture media for isolating a large number of bacteria. So, for example, like I said, uh, you want to look at gram negative bacteria or you want to look at enteric bacteria or you want to look at uh, some other type of bacteria. Then you have certain types of agars that are designed for culturing those types of uh, species. So, here you have another, it is not entirely undefined. There are complex mixtures of peptone, lactose, bile salt, sodium chloride and so on. So, this is uh, for uh, cultivating a particular type of uh, bacterial species. So, many different types of bacterial species will come up on this type of media. These are petri dishes or petri plates. These are the ones that, these are the equipment that we use for culturing on solid uh, media. So, these are the other um, media that are added to the petri dishes or petri plates. These are the terms we use and when you incubate them for anything from 24 hours to 7 days even, it depends on what you are trying to do. It can be anything. The temperature can change, the incubation period can change. It all depends on what you are trying to do. Um, so, these are bacterial colonies which will show up after the incubation period. So, if you are looking at the plate, initially when you plate it, when you add your sample of water or any other uh, sample that you are trying to uh, look at, when you add it to the plate initially, nothing is visible because these cells are invisible to the eye. But after a day, two days or even more, you will find these kinds of colonies. So, this is each colony is assumed to represent a single cell. It is not actually true. It is an assumption just to simplify matters. Uh, it may be a cluster of cells that is the starting point or it may be a single cell that is the starting point. And what we usually see in the lab is that the colony size varies. You will have very tiny pinprick sized uh, colonies or you will have very large colonies. And that is because the starting point may be a single cell or clusters of cells. So, all kinds of things are possible. So, these are examples of bacterial colonies. They will uh, be different in terms of size, shape, color, texture, all these things will be different about different bacterial species. So, this is an example of what are called blood agar plates. Sheep blood was added to the growth media to enhance the availability of nutrients. In one case, on the right you have Staphylococcus and on the left you have Streptococcus cultures. You can see how different the uh, different species of the uh, bacteria are. More examples of plating and how you can use this method for creating pure cultures. So, these are streak plates. These are called streak plates. I will come to more details later about how to create streak plates. Um, it is not just for bacteria. Very often what we get is yeast growth, uh, yeast or fungal growth on the uh, surface of these solid uh, agar uh, media. So, the first four 
The first four that you see over here are bacteria. The fifth one is yeast. Uh, this is fungi and candida is also a yeast. So um, this is very common and uh, it happens in the lab very often that you get the growth of fungi or yeast on these plates if they get contaminated. Um, so these are some examples. Now let's come to aseptic transfer. Now whenever you're doing lab experiments, you have to ensure that the media, especially if you're working with pure cultures, you have to make it the first objective is to ensure that it is an aseptic transfer from one media to another. So in the first case, you can see two tubes. One of them probably has the bacterial culture and you take a metal loop. So these are the metal loops. Sometimes they have wooden handles, sometimes they have metal handles. There is a loop at the uh, end of this particular um, tool. And when it is dipped in the, in the nutrient broth, so this is the nutrient broth that is supporting the culture of the bacteria. This uh, droplet, of the nutrient broth which will stick to this tiny little loop is then going to be transferred to another loop. Now you can't just do it without making sure that the loop is entirely sterile before you dip it into the pure culture. So sterilization is done by what we call flame sterilization. So it's a metal loop, you hold it over a flame, everything is assumed to be dead when it is burnt and only then will you dip it into the growing culture and then transfer it to another steri sterilized growth media. So that is aseptic transfer. The results are shown over here. There are more details for you to look at if you're interested. And this is how streaking is done. Now in this first case, this is an aseptic transfer from one liquid media to another liquid media. You can have aseptic transfer from liquid to solid or solid to liquid and the same process can be uh, used. So this part is the flame sterilization where the loop is sterilized over a flame. Then it is transferred from the nutrient broth to the solid media. The media is the plate, the petri plate and you have a streak. So you just take the loop and uh, run it lightly, very lightly over the solid surface and that will allow the cells that are part of the loop, they will be transferred to the solid media. Remember everything is sterilized except the loop which contains the pure culture or even a mixed culture. From this loop at the end, it's a single streak that is used. At the end of the loop you will have the most diluted concentration of cells. That little concentration is then used to further streak it and the direction changes. So you can see how it's done. The heaviest growth is over here. That is the beginning of the streak. The last point on the streak plate is then used to transfer it to the next one. And you can see one, two, three, four, and five, and finally sixth streak. The sixth streak has individual cells and you can see the size of the colonies. They're very small and that shows that individual cells have now been separated from each other. Otherwise, they're all overlapping each other. Then we come to another method which is called optical density measurement. So you can grow your cells in a clean nutrient media. When it has no cells in it, it will be it will have a certain optical density which will be close to zero because the cell concentration is zero at the time of uh, the sterilized nutrient broth or whatever media you are using. So at t is equal to zero with zero cells added, you will have a certain cell uh, optical density when you use it, uh, when you take a sample of that and add it to a spectrophotometer or even a turbidity meter. You can use anything. You can use a visible spectrophotometer or a turbidity meter for these kinds of measurements. So here we have a spectrophotometer. You can use a turbidity meter for doing these measurements. And we have um, the cuvet which contains the sample. So the light will pass through the cuvet. Now this is the light intensity. I0 is the light intensity that is incident on the cuvet and I is what passes through the cuvet and that is picked up by a sensor. What you're actually measuring is the light that is transmitted through the nutrient media.
Now this light when it is measured is going to tell you something about the optical density of the media itself. So the optical density when there are no cells is close to zero. As the cells begin to grow, depending on the species, you will get different types of growth curves. So you can see the lag phase, the exponential phase and the stationary phase based on optical density only. So this is a very crude method and I say it very clearly that it's a crude method. It does not um, work for low concentrations of substrates. It perhaps works for high concentrations of substrates and uh, getting calibrations between optical density and the numbers of cells or biomass can be difficult. It can work but it can be difficult as well. So like I said the same principle whether it's a spectrophotometer or a turbidity meter can be used and just remember that the light passing through the sample is inversely proportionate to the bacterial concentration. So the lesser the amount of light transmitted the greater the number of bacteria present in the sample. I've already mentioned uh, something about petri plates. As I said, petri plates are standard methods for growing and culturing bacteria in solution. So these have to be sterilized. They come in standard sizes of 90 to 100 millimeters. So the bottom plate is 90 millimeters in diameter and the top plate, the lid, is 100 millimeters in diameter. So what we call statistically significant numbers of colonies on these plates is anywhere between 30 to 300 and the best part about plate counts is that it allows you to measure living or viable cells only. It does not tell you the total number of cells and it tells you that only the cells that are visible on the plate in terms of colony forming units. So that is the unit that we use, CFU stands for colony forming units and those are indicative of the number of living or reproducing cells in your sample and these colonies should not overlap or fuse with one another. This also can be quite challenging because you need just the right amount of dilution to be able to get this kind of result. So it's tough work but after a certain level of practice most people get it right. There are two ways of doing uh, enumeration using plating or plate counts. One is spread plate and the other is pour plates. So spread plates, I'll show you examples of that. Um, so here we have a spread plate. Now in spread plate the nutrient agar has already been solidified and a small amount of inoculum is added. We generally add either 0.1 ml or 1 ml of inocula. So this is added to the surface of the already solidified media. A spreader, the spreader can be plastic or glass. It's a hook shaped object and it's used to spread the sample over the agar surface. It's then incubated always in upside down position to prevent the condensate from falling and disturbing the colonies. So this incubation is done upside down and then the colonies that grow on the surface of the media can be counted after whatever the incubation period is. So it can be one, 24 hours, 48 hours, I've done it as much as five days later. So it all depends on what you're trying to do. In the pore plate method, which is the other method, this the inocula or the amount of sample that is required, you can add one ml because there is no limitation over here. I'll come to this point again. You can add one ml of the sample and then add the sterilized agar containing medium to the plate. Now, the problem with this is that the temperature of the agar containing media has to be fairly high. So it's about 45 to 55 degrees. And at that point, if your samples, the cells in the sample contain uh, bacteria that have an optimum temperature of let's say 20 degrees or 15 degrees centigrade, they may die because of heat shock. So that is the only problem with the pore plate method. If they are um, bacteria that 
are capable of surviving even 45 and 55 degrees centigrade temperature, then it's not a problem. So you com uh, combine it, swirl it to mix it, incubate it again in top uh, upside down condition and the col colonies can be counted after the end of the incubation period. So the advantage of the spread plate method is that there is no heat shock but the small sample size means less dilutions are required but it also means that the sensitivity of the method is poorer compared to the larger sample sizes. So when you have large sample sizes you get better results. And then you have pore plates. So you have one ml uh, sample, like I said, can be added. The colonies can be grown. I've mentioned all these points. And uh, this can be quite challenging because if uh, you're doing, if you're used to doing rich cultures and then you move to doing very poor nutrient uh, environments like water supply systems, then it becomes very difficult to figure out what is going to work and what is not going to work. So these are important factors to keep in mind and work out what are the best uh, conditions. Then we come to what is essential for cereal dilutions. Now let's say you take a wastewater sample and wastewater contains millions to billions of cells per ml. I obviously cannot take one ml of that wastewater and put it on a plate because I will get a complete lawn of bacteria and there will be nothing that is countable. So to get a countable result, I must do what are called serial dilutions. So for serial dilutions, we have what is called 1 in 10 dilution. So you take a, a tube, you take 1 ml of your sample, make it to 10 ml total volume. And so that's 1 ml of the sample and 9 ml of your uh, mineral media, whatever you use to buffer the dilutions. All of it has to be sterilized, including the test tube. So all solid and media have to be sterilized. So here you have 1 is to 10 dilution. You can start with the original sample. 1 is to 10, 1 is to 100, 1 is to 1000. And it keeps going on in multiples of 10. So this is called serial dilution. Now you take 1 ml from this after mixing it properly and plate it on petri plates. You can use spread plates or pork plates, either way. You can see the first two results, they are too close. The colonies are overlapping, they are fused together, so you will not get a clear result. In this case, we say too numerous to count. TNTC stands for too numerous to count. Then we come to 10 to the power minus 3, 10 to the power minus 4 and minus 5. You can see in 10 to the power minus 3 there are 159 colonies clearly and distinct from each other. There's no overlapping, there's no fusing and this fits within our statistically significant window of 30 to 300. That's easier to count. Uh, below 30 it's not very precise because the amount of sample that you're adding to the plate is just 1 ml and when you get only 3, you can see the difference. You would want, if 159 is the most precise result, then after the next dilution, you should get about 16. You should get about 16 colonies, but you're getting 79. And in the next dilution, you're getting 3. So it's not, it should be 1 tenth in each dilution but it doesn't work that way. So here you have actually two statistically significant results but the higher number is generally considered better than the lower number. The lower the number the greater um, the lack of precision in the uh, count. And after the plates are done, so we normally get plates like this, you put them under a magnifying glass, you have what are called colony counters. And the way to do it is you have a clicker counter, so you have pens which have a clicker on them and you can just uh, put a dot against each colony and each dot when you make a dot will click and you have a digital readout of the number of colonies. So this is the digital readout of the number of colonies. And if you have the ability to take photos, store them on your PC, makes it even more easy to count. So here is our glass slide. The yellow part is the glass slide. You put your sample on the glass slide and the glass slide itself has ridges. 
so the sample will collect in those ridges and you have a cover slip the blue part is the cover slip and this cover slip may have a grid on it so when you put it under the microscope all these cells will be observable through the grid and you can count the number of cells so this is if you get such a clean image then you can count the number of cells in any of these squares so ideally you would count these 16 squares within the central larger square so we have 16 small squares and you count each one of them and in this case you have 14 cells now in practice we generally count this 3 4 or even 10 times to get um, a good number of fields of vision and then you take an average of those 10 fields of vision to get a good uh, average and a standard deviation because it's not often that you get uniformly distributed samples because uh, bacteria have a tendency to cluster they uh, even though they are free living and independent organisms they don't break away even when they are dividing they come they tend to remain stuck together uh, so conventional microscopy cannot distinguish between living and dead cells however we have already seen in fluorescence microscopy that you have specific dyes for uh, enumerating living cells and separating them from dead cells so that is already uh, I've already covered that cell concentration can be too low in which case the number of cells in this window may be zero and it becomes very difficult to quantify precision like I said is very difficult to achieve the standard deviation and the mean values can be very close to each other and it becomes very difficult to count and then uh, you may need a phase contrast microscope if the cells are not stained and that again adds a level of complexity to the entire process these are the results of membrane filtration I've already mentioned membrane filtration uh, where you take a water sample so for people like me who work in uh, water samples what do we need uh, water unlike waste water has very few cells cell concentration is in the range of about thousand cells per ml or even less now when you're dealing with very small samples not like wastewater which has billions of cells so when you're dealing with uh, water samples which have very very low uh, cell concentration then you need large sample volumes to get a detectable number of cells or cell colonies so we use membrane filters so you vacuum filter the sample you can take as much as 1 liter 10 liters whatever you want and um, depending on the precision you want you can take any volume of sample now you can see what has happened over here 100 ml of the sample was filtered and you get colonies that have fused and overlapped with each other and you can see the size variation so this is what is called a chromogenic agar uh, media it, so this membrane filter is resting on a nutrient pad this nutrient pad has been um, it comes in sterilized packages the membrane and the nutrient pad come in sterilized packages they are commercially available all you need to do is add sterilized water to this and when you sample uh, when you filter the sample through this filter you can count the number of colonies and you can see that the larger colonies represent a cluster of cells however for standard uh, method uh, from the point of view of standard methods we stick to the idea of colony forming units keeping in mind that each colony forming unit may represent more than a single cell in any case it represents at the minimum a single cell the others are SEM photos which I've already shown you in the previous module these are plate counts and these are colony forming units you can see if the distribution and the spreading of the cells is good then each of the colonies is fairly well defined and they are more or less of the same size what you can also see over here is that the colonies are slightly different in color so there is there are grayish colored colonies there are bright yellow colonies and there are bright yellow orange colonies 
Now these each colony represents a different species. Now you need to isolate these species and look at them uh, using biochemical test kits to decide or to decipher which one of the species it is. So plate counts will not give you that information unless you are using uh, species specific media. This is nutrient broth. This is a generic media that's used for cultivating all kinds of uh, bacteria. I've already shown you these examples as well, so I won't spend any uh, time on it. But just to remind you that membrane filtration and microscopy can be used for enumerating bacteria. I will stop at this point. Thank you.